This is the Fantasy Football Unlimited Podcast with your host, Kevin Murray. Welcome to the Fantasy Football Unlimited Podcast. On this episode, we have one of the hardest working fantasy analysts on the planet. From sharp football analysis, it's the Swami of Konami himself, Rich Rebar. Welcome to the show, my man. Hey, what's going on? Uh, I'm glad we got a chance to do this. Uh, you and I, I got to meet at the expo a couple of times. We haven't really gotten to like, to like chat though. Like, you know, there's always so many people at those events and it's hard to like, there's always with you with a group and you see someone, it's like, oh, I don't want to like interrupt them or like try sure, to put it sure. in their conversation. You're like, oh, I'll get back to them. And then you just end up talking to like several other people and things that were, uh, you know, kind of have manifest that you don't get to talk to everyone, right? Like you only have so much time. So I'm glad we get a chance to, uh, you know, kind of catch up and just invest in some one-on-one time here. I love it. No, I'm excited <laughs> for this conversation. You're right. At the expo, it's it's one of those things when you leave it, you always wonder, oh, I wish I, wish I would have spent more time here or there. And it's, it's always the regret, but that's part of the special thing about the expo. There's just so much. It never stops. And so I can't wait to, to hit the expo next week. I'm digging the background though that you have going on too. You got the the Jerry Rice jersey and the the, the Barry jersey. Yeah, two uh, two <laughs> special players. I, I know that Jerry Rice is is your guy. Yeah, Barry yeah. Sanders is definitely definitely my guy. <laughs> but I I respect Jerry so much. Growing up at, in that time, he was he was definitely one of the most dominant athletes of all time. Uh, but for the vis- listeners and viewers that may not be familiar with what you're doing, your work, uh, what is your role at Sharp Football Analysis? Yeah, I'm just a uh, head of fantasy content over there. Uh, it's been kind of nice. I've had a, this my fifth year with Warren. Um, it's been a really great, smooth transition. I mean, he's another person like me, like just likes to work. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm not a, nearly as good as social media or have the dedication to social media that Warren has uh, or the tolerance, I guess should say, that he, that he has <laughs> for it. And, you know, welcoming uh, all, that, all the vitriol into his mentions. I'm, I'm definitely sure. not on that path, but... When I was looking to leave NBC and make that next move, I mean, that was kind of at the forefront of where we start to see where sports betting is going. And it's just continuously grown and grown every year. And a lot of sites were taking on, you know, fantasy analysts and putting those people into like sports betting roles or having them create content for for sports betting. And what I really was appealed by the, the, with the kind of the marriage with Warren was that he was already established in the betting world and I could just bring fantasy football to him and he, we can kind of join these two kind of, you know, powers to so be. And it's been really good just kind of, you know, working alongside him, being able to do what I want to do at fantasy while he gets to do the betting stuff. And we get to chime with each other, what we like to see for site direction as people in the background, but it's just been really nice having like those two worlds kind of be in unison where like i don't have to stretch myself into creating content where i'm not an expert in yeah no you're it's a obviously a great home for you you're really well known for that for the worksheet uh can you describe what that piece of content is (laughs) yeah i mean the worksheet is kind of you know continuously grown and gotten better and better and a lot of People in the industry have strived to push me to make it better. Obviously, you know, you start with like Evan Silva's matchups. Then you had a guy, you know, we, you know, like the the late Mike Taglier take on the primer, which Derek Brown has now taken into. You know, you've got guys like Dwayne McFarland doing the utilization report. Uh, those those people always want to make me push. What can I add? What can I make it stand out? What can what can be better about it? But it's t- typically just like the the little elevator pitch for what the worksheet is. It's it's just a game by game breakdown that offers you. A full player analysis, full team analysis, like get, has sports betting stuff, like literally anything you would want to cover any aspect of fantasy football and gambling for our each game every week. That's, inc- <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Obviously, that can be found at Sharp Football Analysis. Uh, but from a consumer perspective, is there anything else at Sharp Football that just, you know, from your perspective, at, if you put yourself in a, the shoes of a consumer, what are the features and tools and content that you love to see at, at Sharp Football? Well, what's pretty cool is, you know, the last couple of years I've created basically like a living draft guide that I update like the entire summer, add stuff to add content to the entire summer. Uh, we're working on some things in the background. We're even more of like a slow growing company because, you know, me and Warren were kind of like it with a couple people in the background and it's worked out good because we haven't been enough too much for to, that we could chew, you know, early on. So like we've been able to add people along the way and we've got some things in the pipeline to get back to like sharp football stats, right? Like sharp, you know, Warren was, you know, always known for sharp 
sharp football stats, like that side project. And a lot of people used to get like their personnel data and stuff from there. So we're looking uh, to bring back uh, some of that stuff in the pipeline and add some more tool based stuff now that we've uh, you know had some growth and we're kind of continue to slow play it. So I'm looking forward to see kind of where things grow. But uh, yeah, definitely check out like everything I put out this summer. Uh, there's, there's free content, there's, you know, premium content, all those things that kind of lead you into what you'll get in season from like the worksheet. I love it. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now let's, 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 uh, let's talk about the profile picture, the Zach Morris. What's the, what's the origin of that? I've had, I've uh, told some people this story before. It's funny. It's like, you know, now that like stuff like Zach Morris just trash has come out and like things like that. It's like, <laughs> but it's hard for me to change it. Cause it's like just so yeah. synonymous. I, I remember trying to change my Twitter handle, you know, years ago and I got absolutely dragged for it. Luckily no one like squatted on it. No one grabbed Lord Reeves when I gave it up for like 36 hours. Uh, but the story that I always talk about is like from fantasy football, because it used to not always be my AVI. If you followed me long enough, then you know most people it's basically just always been Zach Morris. But the the reason I always had that was when you think about like Saved by the Bell and Zach Morris was he always had an answer. You know, no yeah. matter what, no matter what came up, like he was, I'll get us out of this, I'll figure this out, uh, you know, by hook or crook, you know, in some stances. Uh, but that's how you have to be as like a fantasy football gamer, right? Like things happen on the fly. You you do all these months of preparation and fantasy draft. Like come January, you'll be lucky to have 50% of your drafted roster. You know, you'll have busts, you'll have injuries. You'll have to come up like with some things like you're playing a certain opponent this week. You got to make different roster moves based on that. So like you've always got to be able to adapt. And like Zach Morris was the ultimate adapter. You know, I granted don't take the full measures that maybe he would have taken uh, in 90s misogyny. But, uh, you know, that was kind of the story story of where, where that came from. Well, I love that. And it, you know, with the cell phone, the old brick cell phone, <laughs> I mean, it, it, that, that fits. I love it. You always had the answer. That's good. And uh, what's, what's the origin behind the at Lord Reeves handle? Well, my name was always, you know, my nickname always growing up was everyone always called me Reeves because my last name, it, I didn't get to pick the way it was spelled, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> it, you know, so with the HRI, I've heard it all, you know, that, you know, what you can get. So everyone just called me Reeves, you know, in short. And then when I actually joined, when I trade, created my Twitter account, which I was, I was always so vehemently against social media, which I'm, I'm sure we'll get into at some point too. Uh, at the time, I was like, we're like Game of Thrones is like the biggest thing. Like, so like it just yeah. kind of felt like I'd just tack on, like I'd always tacked on different things to the front of it, like, you know, Sky Reeves or, you know, whatever. And like, so I just tacked on Lord Reeves because it was popular. And that's why, you know, I when I went to change it, I was like, oh, like, am, is this like a pretentious fantasy name? You know, people have like, you know, fantasy expert 101 or whatever yeah, you know yeah. and i was like oh i need to change this because it's like now that like I, I, my following's built up like to the outside consumer it probably sounds like i'm a ghoul or something but that was like <laughs> i created it based off that it just kind of manifested into it when i tried to change it to the roto reeves people remember the those 36 hours uh they, everyone hated it though everyone hated it they wanted me to bring back the lord reeves that's awesome so <laughs> so you uh you're an ohio guy born and raised uh yeah yeah Okay, so so how did you become a 49ers fan? Yeah, I, I've told this story before, too. So, like, uh, my dad was never, like, huge into, like, the NFL. I never really had it forced upon me, like, this is a Browns house, right? Like, you know, like a lot of people do, like, wherever area they're in or, like, their friends. So, yeah, uh, you know, at 1 o'clock, you know, the Browns would play in the this – is, this is the mid-'80s, and, you know, they are running the football with Ernest Biner and Kevin Mack. They're playing, like, this – these slug fests, right? Like – you, the late '80s, you had the Bills, but in like some some John Elway Broncos teams that were like explosive. But like the AFC football was largely like these teams are beating the hell out of each other. You had Marino, as well. Yeah. But like I'd watch the Browns and another team just fist fight for three hours, and then at four o'clock when the, the next game came on, it was always the 49ers. And I remember okay. like man, the 49ers would come on, and it was like playing a different sport. Like why? Yeah. Like, and so like yeah, granted, like like I always say, it was like you know. Uh, you know, losing, losing like your football virginity to Rachel McAdams, right? Like I was like, <laughs> sure, you can call me a front runner if you want, but like I was like, you, were, it was hard to not be in love with like what they were doing, being yeah. like indoctrinated into the sport. Like it was, it was beautiful. It was, it was something crazy. And obviously, they had like cool dudes. Like they had Joe Montana, who was super cool. Jerry Rice was like my favorite, favorite player by far. You know, growing up, um, my dad had, uh, was a co-owner of a, a football card shop, the baseball cards and football cards. And I used to just try to get every Jerry Rice card for a while. You could do it until the sports and sports card industry, like went haywire. And, you know, it was just like, kind of, you know, it started to cannibalize itself for that period. But I for, still have like all my Jerry Rice, like OG cards. I think I have like every single Jerry Rice card from his rookie card to like, I want to say like 98, like, like almost everything, man. 
Nice, nice. Yeah, he he was definitely special. I can see why that that West Coast offense would have been a, a different appeal than than uh, than what Cleveland was doing back in the day. That's yeah, that's, absolutely. That's funny. And then so any, some uh, all right uh, offensive players at some point, you know, like guys like yeah. Webster Slaughter, or, you know, Brian Brennan was always Ozzie nice Newsome, right? Yeah, Ozzy. <laughs> so but any I, yeah. other yeah, any other favorite teams, players in that era growing up? So I was, you know, my dad was a huge baseball fan, so I did get pushed the the Indians upon me. You know, now the Guardians having a, they're having a pretty solid year this year. You know, one of their better ones. Uh, but so I remember we just always were at you know General Mills Stadium. Like we always were at games. You know, you can go because they were they were trash. Like when I was young, you just go for you know five or six bucks. He would just come home from work and be like, "Do you feel like going?" And be like, "Hell yeah, let's go!" And we just go up. You know, you know for like you know ten, twelve bucks and just go watch the games. No one was ever there. Uh, one of my claim to fame is I was at the game where the ball went off Conseco's head. Carlos Martinez hit the home run off of Conseco's head. Uh, one of the coolest things, you know, you think people are like, oh, yeah, I was at this sporting event where, like, this team came back and they won. It's like, man, I saw that ball go off Conseco's dome for a home run. <laughs> All <laughs> the home great. runs Conseco hit in his career, and the one he's, like, kind of most famously for is one that bounced off his head. <laughs> the one that went off his head. I love it. <laughs> well, yeah, that was definitely a, a fun era of, of sports. You know, I'm, I'm biased. I'm sure you're biased too uh do you have any favorite like favorite all-time sports moments as a fan well i i mean as it pertains to kind of you know the the 49ers like they were i always felt like a more connection to the 49ers than i did the the indians i always like liked them more even though i liked indians like they were so like you know the the first like Super Bowl I really distinctly remember is the 89 Super Bowl where they beat the Broncos. I know the year before, when you go back to it, was like the better. That was the, you know, the John Candy Montana drive hitting John Taylor. Yeah. Uh, but I was I was only six for that one. Like I can I can like vividly remember watching the the Broncos game. And, you know, them just yeah. kind of coming out and just blitzcrank and just throwing bombs, you know, and, the, and them just absolutely boat racing the Broncos. And then they didn't win another one from that point until 94. And that one was like such a big deal because it was like that transition where like Steve Young got the monkey off his back game. Yeah. You still had like, you know, peak Jerry Rice, like going absolutely nuclear with the three touchdowns. You know, uh, they, they absolutely just like absolutely dog walked the, the Chargers, Stan Humphreys uh, led yeah. Chargers. So, like th those ones always like kind of stick out the most to me you know before like i kind of faded uh in terms of like being like just like in fandom in general i think being yeah. being on this forum and being exposed to every fan base at once really kind of made me look internalized in the mirror i remember talking to my wife at one point and i was like was i like this she was like hell yeah you were like that and i was like ooh. <laughs> like you know like all right like you know i dial back a little bit like you know maybe being like letting this like l letting this team like steer like the my emotions like shouldn't happen and uh i slowly got out like and and even when the 49ers went back uh you know in 2019 and they made the super bowl with grappolo uh you know i kind of just didn't that was when i knew i was out i really didn't feel like anything at all like i just yeah. was enjoying the sport at that point but yeah i think just getting exposed to, like fan bases all at once and every single fan base in unison you know on twitter and what what, what our field is just kind of was like an awakening point and, you know there, there are some people that are good fans that don't let their you know don't let this like impact their daily lives but yeah they, unfortunately there are a lot that don't either and it's you know it's crazy yeah it makes it definitely definitely makes sense from your perspective and in the world that you live in when it comes to data and and analysis yeah. um, uh, but you, you always appreciate those old memories right i do and you know i i, I think about you know the, the those like big games or get dialed and i just did um, you know, a show with Rotoviz where we we relived the '97 game with the the Packers. You know, the TO catch game, and yeah. like we kind of did some commentary, and that was kind of like the last, like that was like the fulcrum point of that era of 49ers. Because you know, mm -hmm. when I grew, when I said like you know, when I started to become a 49ers fan, a football fan, they were basically good for like 15 years, like of my life, and then yeah. that was like kind of the last. That was like the swan song of that era of 49ers football. Like that, the following year, Steve Young came back and had that concussion on the Aeneas Williams hit and basically, you know, retired after that. That was also like the start of the transition from Jerry Rice handing the the the, the mantle over to T.O., right? Yeah. Like yeah. there, like that, that 49ers like group of like guys, that was kind of it for it. Uh, and that was such a pivotal game too for Packers fans, obviously not because the Jerry Rice fumble and that led to 
uh, you know, instant replay coming back, but also like, you know, Holmgren left after that game. Yeah. Uh, Andy Reed left after that game. They hired Ray Rhodes instead of Andy Reed. Like that was like a big transition period too. They remained good, better than the 49ers until the 49ers got Harbaugh. But uh, that was also a big kind of fulcrum point for the Packers as well. Yeah. Packers, Niners, great rivalry. I'm a Seahawk fan i'm a seahawks guy oh so nice seattle 49ers rivalry was was pretty darn special yeah i grew up i mean steve largent was another dude i grew up oh. with that was like huge yep. you know in my life you so yeah. so cool he had the 81st you know the number 81st yeah uh, yep, so yep. Loved him. You know, that was the afc seahawks yep. uh you know as well og kurt warner too that you That's know right. talk That's about right. brian blades uh you know yep. it was like those dudes were all, were all <laughs> keep cool, coming man. yeah Kenny yeah yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> yeah no good good stuff good stuff yeah uh, i would say largent was my first my first favorite guy for you know, i went player, to sure. when when rice went into the hall of fame i went to the ceremony and he got in uh, inducted with with Emmett Smith, which was cool for that era because yeah. there were so many 49ers and Cowboys fans at the at the induction, and there was you know it's like hey man, we would have had three more Super Bowls if it wasn't for you. And the response was like we would have had three more Super Bowls if it wasn't for you. And like yeah, you know, then yeah. the Packers came on like at the tail end of that and kind of took over their run. But like that Cowboys 49ers like mid 90s firearms race yeah. was because that was like right before free agency like was a thing, and like they just loaded up like those teams yeah. like it was absolutely crazy. Yeah, you got Charles Haley and and Dion and like on both teams, right? Like. Good stuff. Good stuff. <laughs> so, so when along the lines did you did, did you discover fantasy sports? Uh, always. I mean, I was I was always into sports as a kid growing up, and like we were always outside playing sports. It's something that obviously doesn't happen as much now. I try to encourage my kids to get out and play sports, but you know, we were always out playing sports. I remember doing like stuff out of the newspaper where they had like the the pick 'em sheets where you get like a grouping of guys, right? Like it'd be like these six quarterbacks like Marino, Montana, you know, Warren Moon, and like you'd have to pick a guy and like you submitted it in the mail. And like the guys that they did like a points, so, like the, the next week you get like the leaderboard for like the points. I remember doing that as like a kid, like picking them, like my parents cutting them out. I got to send them in and do that. And that just kind of, you know, snowballed into, you know, me starting my friends like, well, let's do this ourselves. Everyone throw a dollar in like when we're, you know, younger. And then we were always playing poker as kids, too. You know, uh, we all had like sacks of coins we'd bring over and play, okay. you know, you know, dealer's choice. And, like so gambling and that stuff like is always like part of my. Um, part of my repertoire and things that I was kind of drawn to. But uh, yeah, I remember always just kind of instantly being kind of fueled towards like the game element of it too. You know, I love the sport of football, but the game element was, was even better for me. You know, I'm still someone that like, I, I'm huge into like tabletop games, like strategy games and board games yeah. to this day. Uh, me and my friends still have like a weekly thing. We get together and we play, you know, frost, this game, frost Haven. It's like a tabletop RPG. Okay. Uh, it's like almost like a, you know, a more linear D and D, but like on rails. Uh, but like, you know, I, I, I've always been into like strategy based stuff. So uh, once you just like, oh, I love this sport and we can play a game based off of it. Like sign me up. I was in. I was in immediately. So, How do we natural fit? Natural <laughs> fit. I love that. So do you remember like who are the first analysts that you actually remember existed, you know, in fantasy? Well, I mean, I, I yeah, when I was younger, so you think about like all the the free sites that were available to play. Like, obviously, there was you know Sandbox. I don't know if people remember Sandbox, but uh, you know Yahoo and ESPN, like those places were still there. Roto World was there, so you still had like the Barry and Westling at Roto World. Evan was just kind of you know was was later after that. I remember, I mean, all, re reading the breakfast table at Yahoo with Salfino and Pianowski. It's funny, is now I got I've gotten to meet those guys. I've talked to Scott about it before. Like to, I used to always love like those uh their their email thing where like they kind of bounce stuff off. I always liked that they didn't always agree. And like it was they almost had like a uh uh, almost like a, 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 a sitcom relationship of a spousal, sure. a spousal relationship, uh, that always kind of translated well. So I always like those guys, but I mean, not to kind of, you know, yeah, I don't want to dunk on any of those guys. They were there and they let it out to be in. But like when I got in the industry, like, you know, I remember telling my wife and stuff like, you know, and my friends, like, you know, where all this, this content is created, like I could do this. And I think I could bring more actionable stuff to the table. And my wife was like, do it then. My wife was like, just go do it. Uh, you know, and I, I finally like kind of manifested that into it. I tried to, to let in, like I was always against social media. I still don't have a Facebook. I don't have Instagram. I don't have, and it's, it actually hurts me that I don't have those things now because they're kind of necessary that e Elon's ruining the bird app. Uh, <laughs> I wish I had some more avenues uh, and I got myself out earlier on those other platforms, but I had a buddy and he was like, dude, you gotta, 
get Twitter is like, you know, you can just kind of like put out your own stuff. Uh, it's easy if you want to aggregate your own news as well. And so I did that. Uh, I, I've reluctantly down, downloaded Twitter, set up a Twitter, got on it. And there was a, a site called NFL Retweet. Uh, and they used to kind of like, he's what it was. They used to retweet like NFL fan stuff. And I used, I was just like tweeting the stuff like you see me tweet like these days, but like at that time, you know, 2011, 2012. And Denny Carter was following the account, CD Carter, and uh, was seen it. And he kind of seen like my stuff was regular getting put out there. And he just reached out to me at one point and was like, uh, would you be interested in writing for, you know, it was then XN Sports. And I was like, I'm not a writer, man. And he was like, you don't have to be to write about fans football. And I was like, all right, cool. As long as you don't mind that. And, you know, granted, I've made a lot of strides as a writer. I'm still definitely by far, like, not a, a talented from the writing aspect of, of this. But, like, it's helped me be, become a lot better as a, an actual writer. And that's kind of, like, where it began. But, like, literally, I was pushed into saying, like, I think there's a hole for like really good content. I was always a huge fantasy baseball player too as well. And when like fan graphs came along and like opened the door for like where you could really create like unique baseball content. And then like you started to see the stuff like PFF come up and it was like, all right, this is opening the door. And I, I was way more drawn to football and obviously it's just not as much as a grind as fantasy baseball is. So like once I could make that transition, it was like an open and shut case. Like I'm full on invest into football over baseball. So did you um, did you go to Twitter initially just to consume content or do you go there to share content? Yeah, I went there like initially to like one, get like better source for information than what was available. Yeah. I think that, that at the outlets that, you know, I was, you know, playing fantasy football at the time and also being able to kind of just like put some of my engage with the other people. I when I first got a Twitter, I engaged with a. Uh, a lot of the people in this space now that helped me, you know, kind of grow because I'm the same way. So I'm really bad at Twitter even to this day because I'm not on the app as much, but I recognize people that are like always in my mentions, right? Like if I post something or like you're constantly replying to me to something like that sticks out to me. I'm like, oh, this person had good thoughts on this, this person had good, and they think repeatedly are in there and it's like, oh, I'll follow this person back or something like that. that's how like you ca catch my eye. And that's kind of what I tried to do in the industry back a decade ago. Like I'm, replying to Sigmund Bloom. I'm replying to Evan Silva. You know, I was doing those things. Like I'm like making sure like, Hey, you see this? Like, and I'm not, I wasn't approaching it like a sword and shield or like trying to be combative. Like some of this, you do get a mix of that still on social media. Cause it, it just is what social media is. You're going to always let you let, when you let everyone in the door, you have some bad people, but I still contend that there's more good people than there is bad people. It's just a bad experience to stick out to you. Right. It's like losses sure. always stick out more than wins. Right. To, yeah. If anyone, um, but I tried to just, I just tried to inject myself as many places as I could. And, you know, like I said, Denny was one that kind of like helped me push out and gave me an opportunity. So a lot of people hate on Denny. They give him, they give him grief, but remember, you know, Denny, Denny's coaching tree, I guess I'm, I'm part of it. Like, it, you know, I'm kind of his rain man. D Denny, yeah, <laughs> Denny, um, if you don't, if you don't understand where he's coming from and, and how he's doing it, you, you might, you know. You might have a weird opinion of him, but he's he's fantastic. His he's account so is great. Like he's really good at social oh, media. Oh, for sure, for <laughs> sure. So so back to just playing the game. Uh, do you have a primary league, like one league that you consider your your main league? Yeah, I have like a, what you know you would call like the main home league. Uh, yeah. We're going on year eighteen of like all okay. of us uh, being being a, a, you know an auction and you know settings get adjusted as you go along the way, but we haven't put a new owner in in eight years so we've had nice. you know we've had a couple people that come and go along the way but we've have we have like i think eight originals of the 12 that have been there for the all 18 years uh which is great i have another couple home leagues that i've always been a part of that's not like the main one i actually run that one that i mentioned but i'm in a couple other ones that just you know i've met people in the area and kind of kept it going with some people that i've uh uh, no. And I look forward to those drafts every year, seeing those people getting to kind of go and draft with them. And especially now that I have my place in the actual industry, they love beating me. Like, you know, they just get <laughs> so, so much. Who's the expert now, man. Right. Like, I you know, pay, come read my content. So it's, a, <laughs> it makes it that much better. Right. That oh, I get to sure. do it. And then they give me stuff. Um, so it's, it's really cool, but I mean, everyone has kind of like their, their favorite, their favorite leagues and they all, yeah. I think, involve your friends because that's how fantasy football was outside of the, the monetary game, which we all play for now, like in the space that we're at, like, you know, 
we wanted the camaraderie, right? Like you want stuff to do with your friends. You want stuff. Like I told you, I have that game night with my friends. It's not even so much to play the game. It's for us to hang out still, you yeah. know, yeah. It's, it's an excuse for us to get involved with each other's lives still. Yeah. That's the foundation of, of fantasy. I think it's what everyone, you know, falls in love with. Obviously there's a competition and, in, and in enhancing the game that mm -hmm. you love a fantasy of football, but, but it's that league. If you have a good league experience, it really changes your, changes your perspective impacts you when it comes to just your love and appreciation for fantasy you guys have any or have you in the past had any just fun traditions in your leagues like live drafts or trophies or punishments or anything like that we actually don't do like the punishment thing it's just like i said that the tradition of the graft, draft is always great just getting that group of people uh together at once again is always fun because you know now that you know we're, we're in our 40s you know life intersects right like you yeah. know we all are rooted and we're all friends but like you know you might see three or four people more than the others right at a yeah. in their daily life so it's always great to kind of have that you know that camaraderie kind of back get everyone back on the you know hey do you remember when we we're all young we used to do this and it was a big <laughs> deal uh in having everyone together it's just so much that's kind of what it is it's the tradition aspect yeah I love it. Now, any uh, any huge rival? Like, who's your biggest rival in, in a fantasy league? One person that it, it feels the best when you win or the one that hurts the most when you lose, too? Yeah, I mean, my, I have a buddy. Uh, his, na his name's Scott Romaculis. He's one of my he's one of my favorite dudes. Super in the tour. He's the one that got me on Twitter, the person okay. I told you about that like pushed me to get on Twitter. Uh, great player. Uh, he, I've got more championships than him in the whole league, but he's got more career earnings than I do. Uh, cause you know, we keep track of everything, you know, so we, we were always those kids too. Like what I said, growing up, we had a wiffle ball league where we kept stats, you know, nice. like we did everything. Like we were, so like the transition of like turning to like fantasy sports was just all, all up in our lanes. Uh, but yeah, he's my biggest rival. Now that I'm like into industry leagues, you know, JJ definitely is probably the person that I butt heads with the most because he plays the most <laughs> like me. He plays the most like me, which is a pro it's problematic for me. Like, especially in drafts, I think he would say the same too. Like we had a point last year where I think we're in like seven or eight leagues together that are like industry leagues. And we were first, second or third. And like, we were within like points of each other. Like in each one, he's like, if it wasn't for you, I'd be doing this same thing. We talk about the 49ers Cowboys things. Like yeah. if it, I was like, yeah, if it wasn't for you. I would have had that damn player and I'd be in first all the way. Like, <laughs> you know, I wouldn't have to worry about it, but we had a real good rivalry going last year. We were neck and neck in so many leagues. It was, it was super fun to give him, to, to give him grief. Is that, is that because you just constantly are talking to him about football? Yeah, I mean, I talk to JJ every day, literally every yeah. day. You know, and it's that's one of the great things about this, uh, you know, in this space is that, you know, I was so against the so being on social media and not really wanting to. And I still don't put a lot of my life on social media. But the fact that this has opened up a door for me to have so many real life friends, not just a profession, right? Like I get to work in the candy store of life like i like i work in the toy aisle man like this is super cool what i get to do i'm super grateful for it. i don't know how long it will last uh, and how long these positions will last they didn't exist when i you know was joining the workforce you know i worked the it, it, i was a production uh hydraulic seal manager for 15 years before i got to do this you know i was super nervous to, to, to quit that job that for 15 years to come and transition to do this in my mid-30s um but i'm just so grateful that i've been able to chance to meet so many people that are i interact with on a daily basis i'm real life friends i don't talk about football with right like i'm just part of th their lives you know guys like jj I, i've I, the last two off seasons i've seen chris allen like eight times i've done mm. stuff with his family you know john daigle i've done stuff and stayed with him i've stayed at him he stayed at my house like i've just gotten to meet all these people you know pat thorman uh denny like i said you know i went you know i've gone to denny's house several times like and, you know just people that are like actual real life friends that i would have never had an opportunity to be friends with if it wasn't for one joining social media and then like getting out there into this space and you see that you know at the expo right like all these yeah. people that are now and you see those stories it's not just my story it's a lot of people you know it's like oh i met so and so we're real life mates now man like we're we're we, we hang out with each other we talk every day and like that's really great and that's you know the the, the, the plus of social media right for sure. And that's the thing about the expo is that you get this whole Twitterverse comes comes alive and, and you actually see like just strong personal and professional relationships that come out of it. Um, it's not something I ever expected. I'd, you know, meet a bunch of internet friends, right? In the middle of <laughs> a mile, right? Um, 
So, but yeah, no, pretty special. And you're right. There's just a lot of great connections that have, have been made in this community. And, and it's cool to see that you've, you've made a ton your, on your own during your journey. Now talk about your journey though. So you, you basically, you met, you know, you ran it, you met Denny. He got you connected. What, what was the timeline from, from when you first started creating content to, to when you arrived with like Roto World? Yeah, so when I first started doing stuff at XN Sports, I mean, I don't know who lo- was along for the ride there. I don't think you can even find these articles. I don't know if it even exists anymore. Uh, I wish I should try to go back and look at some of that stuff. That's I've been around so long, some of these websites don't exist anymore. But, you know, obviously, Denny was already tight with JJ at the time. Like, they were already doing the living the stream stuff. And mm-hmm. so, like, just as a byproduct of getting connected with, uh, you know, Denny, I got in with jj and while i was working at at xn sports jj would then took his job at number fire and you know he had an opportunity to let people in and you think of the people that came in on number fire to start out that were writing articles when we didn't know anything you know myself chris rabon you know scott barrett grant barfield like these guys were jj brought all these people in to create content at number fire and the first article i wrote at number fire was the konami code um you know, back in, in, in 2012, it was 2012, 2013 now at this point. And, uh, you know, by then like that, that was like the article that took off, right. Like for me, yeah. like when that got to come out and, um, I got some more, some more of my content out and that just like opened the pipeline to meet more people. Uh, I started doing podcasts with Davis Maddock. He was the first podcast ever I went on. And as a byproduct of that, there was Rum for Johnny and him and Ryan Forbes did two mugs. And I went on their show and hit it off with those guys just as you know, outside of the football content, but just as far as like, you know, the way we interjected like pop culture and just like our humor was much more on the same lengths. And then R- Rummy put me on with Sigmund Bloom and Evan Silva who he was kind of tight with at the time. And then once I got in with those guys, that's kind of where like it took off. You know, I became good friends with Evan and good friends with Bloom. And, and, you know, Sig, if you ever hear this, I haven't been on the couch in like three years, dude. Like what's, what's the, what's the story, man? Like, you know, I I need to get back on the, on the couch. I miss laying in those cushions. You know, I I didn't come over there and Rick James, this thing, like, you know, let me, let me back (laughs) over. Uh, But once I got with them and like Evan was so crucial as like the part opening the, my career, you know, because obviously he went to bat for me to bring me over to NBC and wrote a world at the time, which was like the, the dream, right? Like that was like the dream and things happened after we got the door i'm sure we'll talk about that when we talk about the industry in general but you know i was uh, i was along the way you know i got an i worked for fake football and rotoviz did some stuff for them but it was like really getting tight with evan at that like got me to where i am now what would have been the biggest lessons you learned you've learned along this journey uh well a couple things like one i i think you know working with you know, Denny helped me to be just like a great writer. Obviously he has the writing background and, you know, that, that was huge. Just, just honing some and getting better to be as a writer. When I went and did stuff for Roto Viz, uh, and working with fantasy douche, I don't know if a lot of people remember fantasy douche at this point, you know, Frank DuPont, which is definitely not his real name. I know a few people that have actually met fantasy douche, like Overzet's met him. Uh, to me, I actually don't want to meet him. I just wanted to live as like a tall tale in my life. Like just like a, an entity, like, you know, like people like talk about like the Chuck Norris stuff, like Chuck Norris yeah, doesn't yeah. push, do push ups, yeah, pushes yeah, the yeah. world down. Like that's how I want fantasy deuce to like remain for me. <laughs> but he was so pivotal, pivotal on me generating, like taking an idea and then crafting the way to put it in an article to suggest to people like this is to write an article with the structure of, well, this is where I could be wrong. And, you know, being able to form that, being able to talk, you know, in declarative statements, like don't say like, I feel, or I think, you know, it's, I believe, you know, you know, be definitive. Like, so like being able to kind of hone that stuff was absolutely massive. And luckily along the way, I, I got jobs in the industry where I kind of had free reign to do the work I wanted to do and wasn't really pigeonholed into like creating content like you have to come over here and do this waiver wire article or like you know kind of be pigeonholed and that was like really monstrous for me just being able to do the work i want to do because i think that's huge for a lot of people that are coming into the industry now that it's more limited in that space right like you kind of have to do your own thing at this point and we'll probably get into the weeds on that a little bit later but you always want to be able to create the content you want to create as a content creator and when you have like that kind of opening it really kind of allows you to flourish yeah, obviously you gotta you gotta take advantage of it when you have that opportunity. Now, can you describe like the process for the worksheet? Like during the season, what is a typical typical work week like for you? 
Uh, yeah. It's, so, I mean, it is, like I said, I try to improve this thing every year. I've tried to make it bigger and badder than it was last year because there's so much more competition in the space. There's so much data in the space, right? Um, so I just try to improve that every year. So typically after Sunday night, I do take Sunday and just enjoy the games. I actually don't tweet a lot during the games because I like to just Sundays, like I have one time to like, here are all the fruits of your labor, so to speak, right? Like I yeah. want to enjoy the game. I want to watch the game with my son. I want to watch the game with family. I want to watch the game with friends and just enjoy football for that Sunday because immediately I wake up Monday morning and I start updating all of like the files that go into the worksheet where I'm pulling data from all the team by team stuff. Uh, and I'm doing that, you know, pulling all of that information all throughout the day, the entire day, Monday, I actually start writing up games on Monday night during kind of Monday night football while it's on. Uh, it's also a pain in the ass. The NFL started to do these multiple Monday night games because now that's more oh. teams I have to wait on information yeah. for. Like, thanks, NFL. Uh, not thinking about me, but I am, I'm literally Monday and Tuesday. I'm, I'm sleeping, you know, three or four hours, maybe a night, those two nights and, and getting all these games out. As, I take pride that it's the earliest of, the, the, of the, all those articles that come out. I mean, I have games literally coming out on Tuesday. I'm updating that throughout the week, not just because they're, I'm not influenced by anyone from the outside, but you know, I want you to be like, Hey, this is here first. Like you, and, cause you can get a jump on a player prop, right? You can get a jump on a waiver wire pickup. You can get a jump on something by having that stuff available to gamers first. Uh, so I d definitely do take a lot of pride in, the, in, in that being kind of someone that, you know, it, Hey, these on starting on Tuesday, you're going to have this information in your hands. Wow, there's no, no shortage of grinding with all that for sure. Uh, what's been the biggest challenge or di most difficult challenge that you've you've faced along the along the journey? I just think the industry itself, I mean, I, I think the biggest challenge the industry has right now is we're starting to see two things. Well, one is this transition, right, where we're starting to see like content creators are working for themselves now. And what does that do to like the big the big website and the big fantasy site. So unfortunately we've, we all have like a lot of friends, like, the, you know, in the past couple of years, we've seen a lot of people move around uh, a lot of sites, you know, not necessarily close up shop transition from what they're able to do. I mean, there was a point there and this, cause I worked at NBC, this is like the telltale like example, right? Like this is a huge site. Everyone wanted to go work for Roto world. It was a privilege. I still remember getting my first check from 30 rock. Like when you still got checks, uh, and like thinking how cool it was, like I got a check from, from 30 rock. Like this is the dopest thing ever, but a lot of people, uh, a lot of problems, like a lot of sites kind of found out along the way is that they were paying so many non consumer facing positions more than the actual content creators. And the content creators were like, Hey, what's, what's the deal here? That, that cause this is like what they said, this is what happened at NBC. And it's like, why can't I just take what I'm making and go put it out myself? And yeah. you start to see a lot more people do that. And it's kind of bad in a way for the, the consumer in a sense, because now it turned to like what kind of like streaming services are, right? Like now, not, not only do you need Netflix, you got to have Hulu. Do you want to read what Evan is? Oh, I need an ETR sub. Do you want to read what JJ has? Oh, I have to have a late round QB sub. Oh, I love the worksheet, but now I have to have a sharp football sub. Then you're going to start making cuts, right? You know, yeah. the, because most people that are playing fantasy football, so the general population are playing in what one to two leagues they're not playing they're maybe for a couple hundred dollars you have like yeah. the degenerates and like those are the people now that are buying our subs especially when we're talking like sharp football or like etr like people that are yeah. spending a hundred dollars a week playing dfs or in player props at yeah. this point and it's and it's kind of hurt like a, a lot of the industry from a top-down stance uh as well and then as an industry in general I've always been one of these people that just want to try to move people away from what is actually popular. So like you have like a, the, another stance where you're just trying to like win the SEO game now because there's the market's so saturated, but the things that do well in fantasy football from an SEO stance aren't really important. Like things like player rankings, right? Like sleepers, stuff like sleepers and busts. Like these are things that like are old school, like are always going to be like great SEO generators, but like really aren't that important. I've always been someone that wants to create fantasy content. Like I want to hand you a fishing pole instead of hand you, you know, a plate of fish, right? Like I want you to be able to not come 
need me. Like, I want to teach you how to play. I want to teach you like the, the game theory aspect of the game. Uh, and that stuff just now, it doesn't necessarily win as well. So you have like this conflict of interest as well from that, you know, uh, aspect as well. I try, I have to do ranking and stuff. So I still have to do because you can't sell really a subscription without rankings, but I've moved yeah. away from trying to do a lot of those other things. Cause I don't think they're truly actionable. I think that they're consumed in uh, a poor manner uh, in, in terms of the, you know, way consumed. I want, like I said, I want people to be smarter at playing fantasy football. And like, those are not necessarily things that are, uh, but do well. And they're, they're, they're SEO generators. So there's a, there's a lot to kind of, you know, spin off of that, but yeah. you, you know, that's where no, I kind of think we are as like an industry. It's really weird. Uh, that's, we're in an interesting space, right. Too, because with the gambling, you know, becoming more, yeah. uh, expanding in every state. And then you start to see more of these bigger tournaments, right? Like first it started with like the Millie maker, you know, in, in DFS, now you're starting to see things like that, you know, best ball mania. And you, you correlate that with like the intersection of where we are in society, where, you know, there's larger, arguably not a larger disparity between the haves and have nots in our society. And a lot of people think that, you know, the only way to kind of give out, get out of exponential poverty is to like win the lottery. And so to speak, so like, you know, to gamble and, we do have kind of responsibility, like I think as content creators, not to always say like, hey, this this is a way for you to, you know, kind of, you know, create profitable income. Right. Because then you start to get people that don't that are coming in and spending money, but it's not expendable income for them. Right. And that's always kind of the the, the, the fine edge you have to cut. And, you know, I can't tell anyone how to spend their money, but I would definitely, you know, always remind people that, like, you should not be doing anything with your money that is not expendable for you like you know so uh we do have a fine line that we're pushing like these bigger tournaments because like they're harder to win right like you're probably going like your 150 best ball mania entries are probably going to lose like you have to yeah. understand that you have yeah. to understand that you'd be okay with that entering those but i don't know necessarily like how much of the public really is because they're thinking of the end game well, i have a chance to play fantasy football win two million dollars right or yeah. you know do these things so uh i always encourage people like if you are if you're out 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 are out in those streets like find a way to kind of go to like those smaller tables first right like build up a a, a bankroll that you can you know play with but you know obviously you know it's hard to do that it's a, that, that joey kanish lifestyle from rounders right yeah yeah uh you know definitely it's a it's a hard way to live a lot of people don't want to live with like the micro losses and the micro wins um but i definitely definitely want to encourage people especially where we are at this time uh with people, you know, and especially coming out of like, you know, the post COVID world where like not mm -hmm. a lot of people have that expendable income, you know, be very careful where you, where you put your dollar. I don't mind that you, if you don't give it to me, it's okay. Uh, make, just make sure you're not, you're not hurting or compromising, you know, your back end of, you know, your family and what you need to support yourself with. Yeah. I mean, that's good. That's great. Great advice for sure. Definitely important topics to, to be aware of and, and to get the message out for sure. And I like what you said about, about, you know, your content and wanting to essentially teach people to, to manage their teams re better rather than just telling them who to start. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I do host a, a, a weekly uh, thing with subscribers like every Sunday morning and, you know, it, it does devolve to a 60% start sit. Like, you know, yeah. that, you know, people love it. That used to be old Twitter all the time, you know, just start sits, but there's, cause there's so much more context that goes into stuff. Right. And, yeah. you know, I just, I'm yeah. someone that definitely wants to be to create nuanced content. Um, and, you know, stuff like that. And I want you to be able to come in because I want to be able to write an article on Saquon Barkley going to the Eagles. And in a field where there's a hundred of those, I still want you to read mine and say like, wow, I did not know that from the other 99. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, like, that's how I try to create content uh, in this space. Um, and definitely want, want people to say like, I, I stand out in that regard. And it's pretty interesting because I definitely don't feel like uh, you know, I, I feel accomplished in the industry. I'm grateful for what I have, but I definitely wouldn't consider myself like one of the best people in the industry. Uh, you know, I'm definitely, I don't, I'm not like strong in any area. I think like if, if you're like going and like creating a character and like a video game, like a Baldur's Gate or an RPG or creating like a Madden character, I'd be like the balanced character, right? Like I wouldn't have <laughs> like no strong suits because I, I do data, but I'm by far not the best data scientist. I don't have that kind of background. I'm not Michael Leone. Like I'm not doing like a, a, a you know stuff like Hayden Winks is doing pulling data. I'm not as good as the game theory side. You know, when you think of like you know a Pat Crane or like a JJ, I'm not that good at like creating like models or like you know like a Mike Clay. But I do enough. I think I'm good enough and well versed in all of those things to kind of put it together uh, in a good fashion and a good product. 
But uh, I think all of those people in those specific areas are a lot stronger than me in those specific areas. Um, and they strive me to be better in those specific areas. But well, yeah, sometimes, I mean, sometimes balance is is the key. It, it is what, what what makes things work best. And I think that, you know, obviously hard work too. You, you're a grinder, right? Like a lot of, a lot of hard work. You can make up for for some some weaknesses in certain areas staying balanced i think that people appreciate that that content and many people would definitely consider you you know on, on the top you near the top of the list when it comes to fantasy analysts so don't don't sell yourself too short there yeah and i appreciate it I, I i've told this to jeff ratcliffe before and explained this analogy to him i, I consider myself the dvd of fantasy analyst okay uh you know i i came along at a point where everyone is getting rid of vhs tapes like i was okay. at that i was like that perfect transition right where fantasy analysis took off and became like a thing like exploded uh everyone like said everyone's getting rid of their vcrs they're getting dvds it was like a huge jump right uh and then you know people kind of came along and like took that dvd idea and they're like oh shit we can make a like, blu-rays then we can start <laughs> streaming it like it was like you know i kind of got like uh, i'm kind of there still like i'm just still like in that that, that media the dvd of fantasy i love it <laughs> well let, let's talk a little bit about the community about the the expo uh, we talked about it a little bit before but but talk to me about your experience heading to the expo you, you had gone to the very first one the midwest fantasy football expo or whatever they called it uh what's what's been your observation with the expo over the last few years yeah not even just the expo i remember going to the fswa stuff and like getting to meet everybody in this space for the first time and i think like a lot of people's experiences you just find out you have a lot of common ground with a lot of people there not just going there for fantasy football but just in life right like you find a lot of people that because a lot of these times when you go to these events you end up not talking about football as nearly as much as you think you're going to right it's a lot about you know where are you from how did you get on this path like what are the things you're you're doing you know those types of things like that right and because like i said be generating like real life relationships with with these people and that's kind of what it is um you know i remember the the first time getting to meet like you know pat thorman and evan Sullivan, us just hitting it off as people and that kind of like sparked like us being a part of you know people's lives uh i'm a big i'm big on shared experiences like uh in life like i i, I think like life a lot of things in life aren't worth doing if you don't have anyone to share it with right yeah. and you know you know i remember like pat thorman was traveling through here with his family last year and like i said yeah definitely you know stop by come see me. We went to Cedar Point, which is in my area. It's like this big amusement park. And I made him ride this roller coaster, made him overcome this fear. He's like, he, he was super scared. He did it like, but like, you know, he has that experience now and has that with me. And like, I get to see him like experience this like fear that he kind of was able to conquer. Uh, and it's so just like I said, generating these real life relationships with, with everyone is just it, obviously the hallmark. When I went to, we were talking about a little bit before the show, when I went to that first fantasy expo that Bob ran in canton and you know it was it was small it was a very small junket you know i'm talking like man there might have been like 15 to 18 like little little booths you know maybe a yeah. hundred maybe he might have sold a hundred tickets this first thing and you kind of wondered it's like oh is this gonna like survive right like did this do well enough to become a thing and then you just see what it's become coming out of COVID and what bob has created it is just it's a massive event like i mean yeah. you just think about like we're it just exploded. I just like, I yeah. mean, and now some people, it's so funny that people come to Canton, Ohio of all places, because there's really not much to do there. Like yeah. out of all the places in Ohio, I would have you go. Like Canton would be pretty low on the list. I even think with LeBron would tell you coming from Akron, Canton, I'd be like, you know, there are a lot of other places in Ohio. We could be, we could be pushing this thing, but it's crazy <laughs> that it's, it's there in Canton, Ohio is like this, this, you know, focal point where the fantasy community comes together at the end of every summer. And I think the timing of it being where it is, in August, where it's just like you know the start of preseason, that first week of full preseason games, yeah, uh, or that you know, and just everyone kind of knowing like, hey, we're about to bunker in. It's like that eleventh hour, uh, like feast, right? Like yeah. where we get to hang out with each other. We all know like the battle we're going into. Uh, you know the, the what follows the next few weeks, and it's going to follow for the next few months for all of us. Uh, that definitely, I think, means a lot for a lot of people too. Like that end of summer, going into the transition thing, like is really cool for a lot of people. Yeah, it's definitely a great way to kick off the uh, the season. Obviously, football brings everybody together. You know, obviously the the sense of the community too. It makes it really special to keep coming back for. Uh, but football again is is what brings people together. Got a season coming up ahead of us. What what are the biggest trends uh, over the past few years that that you see are shaping uh, the 2024 season ahead of us? 
Yeah, I mean, I've, I've wrote an article on the site. This one's a free article, but I always do like a, a league trend series. And the, the top down league trends is the free portion of the site. And everything kind of stems off of this article where you get like quarterback trends, running back trends, wide receiver, tight end and stuff like that. But uh, th this we've, you know, we've been in like this current like defensive meta, so to speak, like coming out of COVID. You know, we had the pandemic year where it was influenced by uh no home crowds right that was like huge like the kelsey's talked about this on their podcast like two years ago what it was like like playing on the road and playing mm -hmm. at home like during that covid season and also that year people may not remember this but like the nfl didn't call holding that year it was like a really outlier year there i don't know if it was like it was in like the, the manifesto to, to referees i don't know if we'll ever know but like <laughs> it's just this huge outlier earlier they just didn't call offensive holding and like obviously like we had this so, so like the 2020 season was like this just bonanza of offense like just absolutely erupted it was the highest scoring season in fan you know in football and when you have that it becomes a high scoring fantasy season as a byproduct it still was good in 2021 but you started to see like some of that recoil and that regression uh it was also 2021 was still heavily influenced by covid that year like especially if you remember the december of that season where yeah. like uh, like there was like 500 people on the covid list in december and then miraculously no one was on it in the playoffs <laughs> like, uh, like pr pretty interesting yeah, how that, but, but, that development was but then like coming out of it these last two years have just been dictated by defenses right you know obviously everyone not, knows about the too high stuff we're seeing more zone coverage zone coverage has dropped you know five years in a row we're getting less blitzes but there's also this element of why our offenses have struggled and i think it's going to be interesting to see how this goes moving forward because it relates to like how I got started. At least there's some irony here. You have creating the Konami code and how uh, vital it was for, you know, rushing performance for these quarterbacks, something you could mm -hmm. take advantage of uh, how weighted the scoring was because the influx of mobile quarterbacks now, and it's just natural inheritance, right? Like they're just better athletes playing the position than there was. It's just evolution. But what has happened is we still haven't had like that perfect intersection of the athlete to passer ratio, right? Like, yeah. you know, we, we haven't seen like that, that merge where like you have Tom Brady paired with Michael Vick, right? Like being yeah. one entity, like obviously Mahomes is like the best thing going in that area. You have Josh Allen, but the mobile quarterback aspect and the influx of mobile quarterbacks right now has actually thumbprinted so many areas of the game that you may not think are directly related to this, right? Like we're starting to see more, uh, less play under center in the NFL. And that's a problem actually into this current defensive meta, because if you're just going to be like, you know, you're not going to be, you're going to be one dimensional, right? Like we're going to just sit back and shotgun and we're going to run shotgun play 70% of the time. It's harder to run successfully out of shotgun. You're not, you're not dictating, you know, box counts as much as that. You're not able to be multiple. And that's like what's having success in the NFL right now. And you think of like the, the systems that are the most successful in the current de defensive meta right now, it's what is it? It's the Shanahan McVay coaching tree, correct? Yeah. Like when you look yeah. at these guys, and I would include the Lions in there as well. Like Ben Johnson's not specifically from that tree, but he's doing a lot of things those guys are doing. These are guys that are able to go on, go and play under center. You can throw from under center. You can run from under center. Like you can do a lot of these things that, you can adjust what the defense is doing in a, just a lot better fashion right now. Cause you look at just from a passing stance, the NFL was in shotgun 71% of the time is the highest rate in, in league history, at least since we have had the data available. But what shotgun does is it really reduces the rate of play action, which we know has been like an inherent cheat code, right? Like, you know, over the past years, the NFL still is averaging 8.2 yards for pass attempts with the use of play action, 6.6% without of it. Well, out of shotgun, play actions only been run 13 and a half percent of the time shotgun under play action which again is only getting run at sub 30 percent now test the nfl but like 83 percent of all under center passing plays are play action passing plays you still have like this cheat code we're finding out uh too like from a fantasy football stance mobile quarterbacks have really hurt the running back position a lot of people think it's because of, like this compartmentalized backfield and you know we you now have these guys in these specific roles and there's definitely an element to that where you have like, you know, Jameer Gibbs is playing a role and Dave Montgomery is playing a role. But look at what mobile quarterbacks have done in terms of impacting the running back position because now we're getting more mobile quarterbacks. Mobile quarterbacks are taking up a bigger piece of the pie of rushing attempts in the NFL. Who does that hurt? Running backs. Running back targets have dropped. Targets per game for running back position have dropped six straight years in a row. And it's really hurt, you know, the receiving aspect of these guys that have an out. 
And we start to have like a little bit of a Konami code now in, in terms of running backs. Like, do you have a three down running back now? Do you have a guy in catch passes? That's a little bit of a cheat code right now. Yeah. Your guy catches passes. Um, and they're stealing so many touchdowns from running backs now because we're seeing that the NFL has said like, well, where can we use utilize quarterback rushing performance the most? It's near the end zone because you force defense to play 11 on 11 football versus 11 on 10 football versus a traditional handoff. Right. So like quarterbacks have really kind of thumbprinted uh, the game in a lot of aspects, mobile quarterbacks, that is than we've seen. And I have a lot more details on this stuff, like time to throw time to sack, like what's hurting offenses, you know, because I was at the forefront of like the stuff you see now I was writing about like the impact of sacks like five years ago. Uh, you know, you starting to see that a little bit everywhere now, you know, pressure to sack ratio and stuff like that. Yeah. But, uh, um, there's a lot of really cool data that I definitely think stems around the influx of mobile quarterbacks more than a lot of people realize. That's a th all fascinating stuff and a great example of why if you're not if you're not following uh, your content like if someone's not following Rich Rebar they, they need to because there's a lot of great stuff out there and, and obviously content gets much deeper there's so much more context to everything you just said uh, and and that's that's why people should be following your stuff and, and getting your content now heading into 2024 like for like a redraft season um, is there a certain philosophy you have for co roster construction? And are, is there any players that you just you just have to jump ADP for that you just you really want to get on your rosters this year? Well, definitely first and foremost, you want to structure whatever your draft plan is around your league settings, right? Like your league settings are going to dictate the way you should be playing that particular aspect of the game. I play in a lot of full PPR sites that start three or more wide receivers. I've always been more of, especially as the league has transitioned to the, some of the things that we've talked about that have influenced it. And we've seen kind of that reduction of the bell cow running back kind of go away. I've been in more of an anchor running back, hero running back, whatever people want to call it, right? Where you basically have one of these bell cow running backs lead your position. You kind of rotate that RB2 spot. You try to almost lock box into something, so to speak as well, you know, uh, where you're not paying like a premium capital, you're avoiding that dead zone that people have always talked about, you know, in recent years and you're loading up on these wide receivers. The one other aspect that is that, that we didn't talk about, like one of the biggest wide receiver trends now is NFL offenses because have, have adapted now to where the traditional like X receiver has kind of died as well. Like remember you, when you and I were probably in our heyday, you would have that traditional X receiver was who you wanted in fantasy football yeah, uh, and was dominating. Now NFL teams have combated the kind, kind of difference of defensive meta of saying like, we need our guy, we need to move our best player around now. We, so you're seeing like these these wide receiver ones now move around to the slot more. They're getting them access to more targets behind the line of scrimmage, like more freebies, free squares, so to speak, getting the football to your best players. That's always going to drive offenses. One of the mis mistakes I made early on in my fantasy career was trying to do offensive coordinated data when it came first like to the forefront where we had it and trying to use it steer and, and let the coordinator steer that versus the personnel. If you if you go back and relook at, you know, offensive coordinator data, it's always personnel driven. Like the, the, the ball goes to the best players. And sometimes that may change on a given week based on who teams have available, but personnel is always going to dictate kind of where the ball is going. And that's what we've seen the NFL kind of adjust in that period. So uh wide receiver one now, production now has become restricted when the NFL was going on and moving on to more like three wide receiver sets. And you started to see that more 11 personnel, it actually hurt wide receiver one production. It, it leveled it off because there was more wide receivers on the field. Targets were getting spread around more. Now NFL offenses have kind of combated that and saying like, we just want to get the ball to our best player. Like we have to get it to CD lamb. Like you saw the Cowboys are like a great example of this last yeah. year. Like we are going to do everything we can in our power to get the ball to CD lamb. And like that now has become like more of what you want for a fantasy player. Like guys like I'm on raw St. Brown, right? Think of like the biggest wide receiver one seasons we've seen recently. Think of like Michael Thomas and Cooper cup, yeah. right? Like those types of uh, those, that types of usage where like it typically like that would not be, it wouldn't be frowned upon, but we would say like that archetype would be air quotes limited in fantasy yeah. football where that's not, that's like the kind of guy you want now. Uh, you don't want to be like a pure slot player, but like you want your guy to have access to these, like to combat, like where the current defensive meta is, right? Like Dom on Ross of the world. Um, so that's pretty cool. Like try to, so I've been a, like more of a, a, an anchor RB zero RB, zero RB kind of builder this year, I think just swerves into that, right? Like we have Christian McCaffrey, then you have like that mini tier of Brees Hall and Bijan Robinson. And then it's an immediate gap, right? Like you go, yeah. Even like a guy like Jameer Gibbs is sharing his backfield, right? Now, when you look at Jameer Gibbs without David Montgomery for that four-week stretch that David Montgomery is out, he was that 
guy, right? So there's yeah. a reason why he still is being drafted where he was if you get like that contingency value. But it immediately kind of tapers off after that. We don't have the guys that fit that criteria. So I'm still just loading up on those wide receiver ones and then kind of playing my builds out that way. One of the unique things that you can do this year that you could never do in years past is that the ADP is kind of a calibrated for this too. Um, is that now you can draft three or four wide receivers in a row and still get a guy like Travis Etienne or Joe yeah. Mixon. Like that would never be the case, right? Like those yeah. are guys that were locked in as like second rounders or early third rounders at the worst. And like now you're able to get those guys now in like the fourth round. And that just didn't exist the way we played fantasy football. So I've generally have been structuring away my lineups like two ways. I, don't, I get Brees Hall or get Bijan Robinson, and I just draft wide receivers for several rounds, or I open up with one of those guys, then I start to feel out where the wide receiver position breaks, right? Like where you're drafting the Jaden Reeds, the Xavier Worthies, even like that tier of like Hollywood Brown, right? Like we might be hopeful for, but it's still are pretty risky. Whereas like you can take this running back like an ETN or a Mixon and say like, these are, this dude's getting 300 touches and you yeah. can throw that now with your wide receivers that are getting 150 targets, which you never used to be able to do in years past. You were always investing at the running back position at a, at one of the weaker points, the weaker inflection points. And that's not the case this year. Uh, I, I won't specifically talk about any players, but like the, at a position, like we're, guys have been more aggressive on versus the field. Jaden Daniels, for that Konami reason, uh, mm -hmm. I would say Rashid Shahid at wide receiver. Uh, at running back, I'd say Tajay Spears. And I don't really have like a tight end that I think fits your definition of what you're looking for. But I'll say my favorite tight ends to draft at cost this year in order have been kind of Mark Andrews, uh, Kyle Pitts, George Kittle, and then Brock Bowers, Pat Fryermuth, like like based on like where you're taking a tight end in sp specific sections of the draft versus other positions. So that uh, I think I covered uh, some ground there. I think you did too. Yeah, <laughs> no, you got me fired up for fantasy football drafts coming up. So. <laughs> So let's dive into some rapid fire questions. I'll just throw out some questions. Let me know what, what first comes to mind. What do you uh, what do you enjoy most about what you're doing in the industry at this time? Like I said, I mean, still just that I'm getting to do the work that I want to do, uh, get to create a lot of that content. I think it's steering people in a direction. I think, like like I said, you know, I'm looking at these league wide trends, things that like could steer you to more micro edges versus like here's a list of richest sleepers, right? Which, you know, well, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people have. I get that people want to know the guys I'm. Because you got no matter what, when you're on the clock, you're selecting a player. So you yeah. want to, I get that people want to know like the players, like we talked about those four guys or that group of guys that I talked about. But I like being able to create content. I like that I still like have, I'm able to enjoy sports betting, but not create like content around betting a lot. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, DFS is still more of a fantasy driven game. So that's pretty cool. Um, I, that aspect is there, but kind of the things we kind of have already hit on um, for sure. Perfect, perfect. Now, what uh, what's your favorite part of the NFL offseason? I mean, my favorite part of the offseason is, again, just like get, get, do some of the content that you don't, or, or you're not afforded to do during the season. I was on a show with Justin Boone, and he called it being on the conveyor belt. I thought mm -hmm. that was a great analogy, like in the season, like said, you know, you're on like once Monday starts, like I can't like, you know, I'm back on the cycle of, you know, getting through yeah. these things and nothing's evergreen come Sunday. It dies and we repeat the process, right? It's yeah. fun to create stuff. I can go back to something I created in May and say like, that's still viable right now. It's actionable where like that doesn't happen in season. So it's like really great to have that as something to kind of go back on. Uh, definitely love like what surrounds the NFL draft though. As far as yeah. like, you know, you have the rookies coming in, right? You have that rookie analysis and that's kind of come so far too in the industry, right? Like that's been one of the, the yeah. areas that have kind of have grown. I mean, dynasty is still more of like a niche, like consumer product in terms of like monetizing it, but it continues to grow. Uh, people want, you, you know, evaluation if you're a redraft player on these rookies now, because a lot of people have come on to realize that like, so the fan, one of the biggest hurdles the fantasy industry still has as players is like you still have to be smacked in the face with something the fantasy industry wants to see something before they believe it's real and then but we kind of know inherently the best values from a value perspective are always going to be guys that haven't shown you something so the the, the one-year players the two-year players that haven't popped like those are always going to be where you want to take your your shots at and more people have yeah. started to realize that so they just want more information on those types of players to make more educated guesses right uh, you know, to, to find a Puka Nakua, right? You know, to find those yeah. types of guys that you know break out because the first round guys, everyone knows. Um, but people want more of like that that dirt on these guys that are growing, you know, in round two, round three. This year, especially where we had like those 10 wide receivers kind of get drafted in just a lump. Yeah. You know, when you think of like McConkey and Keon Coleman and Jalen Polk and Ricky Purcell and Xavier, like all those dudes went like in a span of like 15 NFL picks. 
Yeah. Uh, and you know, they're, and you see their ADP kind of reflected that. So like that, I think this year getting like those guys out of that group who, who treaded that water, the, the, the best could be like a big fulcrum point of seasons this year. For sure. For sure. Now, what are your favorite hobbies and activities outside of sports? I mean, I d- d- grew up like a, a huge nerd, like I've kind of hit it upon, like, you know, I'm huge still in tabletop gaming. I've always been into, you know, video gaming. I came up on that aspect of trajectory where just video games were in- interjected into life. I don't think I'll ever stop playing video games. I think I'll probably play them until I die uh, along for that, along for that ride, you know, kind of that boom, you know, when Nintendo popped, I was the perfect age and I don't see myself really kind of turning around from that. Uh, so I still play a lot of video games. Uh, still love, you know, movies and, and pop culture, you know, watching a lot of a TV when I can. It's more in the off season than it is during the regular season, trying to catch up on the things I missed. The thing that makes it harder now is just like not having something spoiled for you, you know, for not sure, having something sure. ruined for you anymore. That's uh, right. So that's the hardest part of, you know, trying to consume content the way I have to. Yeah, that's right. Now, it makes sense with the up, up, down, down, left, right, left, right. <laughs> yeah. I love it. I love it. Yep, yep. Now, what's your, what's your favorite all-time movie? Um, I don't know if I have a favorite. Like, I think a lot of these, like, kind of, like, answers of it, you're going to hate me because, like, I just, I think it's just nebulous, right? Like, uh, you know, different, yeah. you, you, you know, you have movies you love or things change throughout your life. I'll say this. The way I'm going to answer this question, hopefully it's at least different than other people have answered it. I'm going to tell you the movies that I saw that kind of were like game changers for me okay. on my like movie yeah. watching experience. The first movie that absolutely just kind of like blew me in a way. And I think just like was a big transition for how movies were made was Terminator two. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And Terminator two came out. It was like, the, and, and there are still effects that hold up to this day. Uh, that movie still really hold practical effects that hold up this day. I mean, then you think about like that era, what it spawned, like a movie like, like Total Recall, the pr- practical effects in Total Recall still hold up like amazingly to this yeah. day. And, you know, especially in this era where we we had like that transition, uh, you know, CGI wise, where like it got leaned on too much. And you kind of go back and like some some movies that came out like the early 2000s don't even look as good as movies uh, that came out, you know, in the mid 80s or like yeah. the transition period. Then I'll say like there was a gap in uh, the other movie. The next movie that kind of like really changed everything was was The Matrix. When it came out, I got the uh, the 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 Morpheus picture behind me here, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, the red, red, red pill. Gloom. Cause I remember when the matrix was coming out and seeing previous to the matrix, I'm like, what the hell is this man? Yeah. Like, what is this? Like, what even is this movie going to be about? Right. Like what they had released from the trailers. And then like, you just knew five minutes into that movie. You were, we were going to be watching something that we hadn't seen to that point. And yeah. granted that, that matrix, the matrix spawned a lot of the things that I talk about afterwards, even in the own matrix movies, they started to rely on some of the things that they, used in cgi wise and it kind of created like a, a kind of i think of a, a, a wishy-washy area of cgi yeah. especially the use of people like we still can't cgi people i mean literally like black panther is an amazing movie and literally the worst part of that black of black panther is that third act when they you know he's fighting killmogger and like the, they have to do cgi in the the train it just looks it looks trash it looks awful yeah. we still yeah. can't do we still can't do it um and the the last one i think a couple years ago and i saw the first spider verse with my kids Mm. And like, it just changed, you know, and then granted yeah. that group of that group of people like Phil Lord and the way they make movies, um, because that was a movie scene, scene for that. Like, it's like, what is this? You know, what is this? I grew up a huge Spider-Man fan and like yeah, reading comics yeah. and I was excited for the movie just by default. But then that was another movie, literally two minutes into it. I knew we were in for a different type of movie experience we had had. And, uh, definitely. So I'll say like those three movies, just from like a first Good. time viewing, I knew, we're going to be like transitional periods for like movie watching for me. That's a great answer. I love the way that you broke that one down. How about a sports movie? You got a specific sports movie? Yeah. Major league, I think is so much my favorite. Uh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Being, got... being growing up an Indians fan. Yeah. Uh, still sticks to this day. And I still, I, I'd still contend like not all the baseball stuff's amazing in that movie, but I still think a lot of it holds up. So good. That's definitely one of my favorites. Uh, it is my I mean, favorite. I remember being in the theater like when when Wesley Snipes robs the home run and oh, being just so jacked, good. like, oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. How about I have an all-time favorite TV show? Uh again, that's another one that I think is is more like up in the air. I think like a lot of people, I like a lot of like the the all-time greats, like people like Breaking Bad and The Wire. I love that. I think things that stand out, obviously, like the first four seasons of Game of Thrones, the first three seasons of Community. I'll say my favorite wire to wire 
uh, recent show to come out is uh, BoJack Horseman. Okay. Um, easily, easily probably my favorite modern show. Just the the topics that it handles, uh, the character development of that show, the Hallmark episodes. I think Time's Arrow. Uh, if you're not familiar with BoJack, uh, the season four episode, I think it's one of the best episodes of TV made maybe in the maybe ever at this point uh i'm a big leftovers fan too love the okay. leftovers uh if you've seen that um but yeah i would say bojack's my favorite modern show wire to wire i, I absolutely adore bojack okay how about uh, how, what's your all-time favorite video game i got oh man so many so many video games you know i got the uh the 3d printed you know zelda behind me uh the cartridge uh, behind me obviously love that love link to the past uh, love the Mass Effect series. I actually uh, grew up. I was a competitive Madden player. Nice. Uh, we were talking about like a series. Uh, I used to drive around. This is when you, they used to hold Madden events in stadiums, uh, and I used to drive around and travel to these events and play competitive Madden in the actual stadiums. Those, it was really cool. That's um, awesome. Yeah. Uh, so like as a series, that's probably been like the most influential. Definitely probably the most hours of uh, video games i played uh, a lot of rpgs i got the final fantasy 7 picture behind me too uh, you know last of us behind me uh i remember chrono trigger uh, for snes i uh, i remember trying to talk my mom into the into getting chrono trigger uh because it was at that point it was a hundred dollar game and then you know and, and, and uh, games like the games were like 50 bucks and it's pretty funny like how like video games like uh the times really haven't changed in terms of cost. It's also funny. Like I play like, tabletop games. I'm huge into tabletop games. Like I said, and like, uh, I play like some tabletop games, like 200, 300 bucks. And people are like, that's way too much. I never played for that. I'm like, wait, you spend 60, $70 on a video game. And you play it 20 hours. And you're done with it. I've yeah. played this game for 400 hours in my life. I play like 400 hours of this tabletop game. Think of yeah. what the dollar per like investment was for you versus me, but you didn't want to buy that, that, you know, I get it, the lump sum, but people spend $60 on video games and just never play them again. Right. Uh, but sounds yeah, like remember, a bargain. Sounds like a bargain remember, to me, but I remember trying to talk pleading with my mom, like, mom, I gotta have this video <laughs> game. No way. It's a hundred dollars. There's no way I'm getting you this shit. And like, and you know, just, and I'm just like pleading with her. I have to, what do I need to do? What do I need to do to get this video game? And finally wore her down, did like extra chores, like got her and got it. And like, yeah, that, so that game, especially cause that was like the first game I got where like a legitimately like had to work, like work for it. Like got it. And it was like this prized possession. Cause the money that went into it, like, or, you know, trying to earn the money that I, Put up towards it being being expensive uh absolutely amazing but there's so many so many great video games uh, that i can get i could list off um, a million man for a, a whole nother <laughs> show for sure uh any um uh like a favorite vacation you've been on or a bucket list travel destination you got i still have a long ways to go i mean i was someone that had kids young so we didn't get to do a lot of traveling as a byproduct of that we're doing a lot of it later in life so there's a lot of places i have to go i just got jealous denny just got back from greece i would love to go there as well maybe but famous recent vacation we're big we're also big on vacations we're not just doing as family but like incorporating other families like i said we're mm -hmm. big my wife's the same way we're just big on shared experiences who yeah. can you have it with i recently a couple years ago was fortunate enough to go on a vacation where we drove to cape cod uh and uh we rented a, a house with with thorman and his family denny and his family pete overs and his family. that's where the infamous frisbee throw came where denny okay. was trying yeah, to catch yeah, the yeah. frisbee that happened on that trip yes. but we decided to drive and we broke it up on the way out there we went to cooperstown with the baseball hall of fame and cooperstown nice. what an amazing little city what an amazing yeah. little town for anyone that hasn't been there it's like the middle of nowhere new york but just a little baseball town it's absolutely great i would encourage anyone that gets a chance to go there to stop there just for the, the the culture the baseball culture there the aura that it has it's just this just great little town so we went there first we went to cape cod got to spend time with all of those great families like get to get to know people even a little bit better and on the way back we went to hershey pennsylvania and got to go do that for like the first time and that was just super cool uh you know going to the the chocolate factory and the amusement park there uh getting to do those things those those are really good time as well i just recently got back from uh uh, a bourbon trail for the first time. I went on the bourbon yeah. trail with Chris Allen, uh, his spouse, uh, and then John Daigle and Justin Edwards and their Justin Edwards and their significant others. And it was a blast spending time with those those guys and getting to see some of like the 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 beautiful area that is that that area of Kentucky. Man, the land is beautiful there. But uh, it's definitely I still want to go. When me and my wife like whenever we're planning trips at this point, Denver always just like is like the runner up. It okay. always gets ruined. But like I really want to get to Denver and. I'll see it now that it's exploded with like food culture. I, I hear it's a great adult city. I definitely want to go there. Um, and then, um, you know, maybe Alaska, stuff like that. But 
definitely probably Greece would be number one still but okay okay well i love i love the the theme of the shared experiences that's yeah uh, that's, that's absolutely a that's a good one what uh what's your go-to snack or beverage uh go-to snacks that definitely has changed over the course of my life i'm someone that had in their late 30s going over 40s i had some i had some healthcare stuff I had to really change the way my life is if you see me on old videos you'll, you've noticed probably the difference that uh, i lost like 60 pounds so my favorite like go-to snack in my 40s is usually berry blackberries raspberries like my go-to okay. doing well if i'm going now with sugar uh i don't know if you guys have had these reese's animal crackers like these things are made of oh. actual cocaine. Like they're made out of heroin. I don't know, <laughs> really? like, dude. Like, um, so another thing that like really has transitioned my life. Like, I, my my youngest kid had a had a peanut allergy, mm. and we went through like the trials to get him out of the peanut allergy. So like we yeah. didn't have any peanut in, peanut butter in the house or like anything peanut butter related for like six years. So the second like we could like I went like that long without having it. Like I just want everything like peanut butter now. Like in, in this. <laughs> it's really bad for like my weight loss too because you know peanut butter is <laughs> sticky but if i'm going that route like mostly peanut butter sorry with these reese's animal crackers are, like absolute they're made of okay hair. okay i'll have, <laughs> I'll have to check that out who's the, who's your favorite band musician artist of all time um a lot i mean being that my age i'm super wide range uh in terms of music i i love 80s power ballads or like yeah. you know the 90s <laughs> 90s hip-hop was always my thing too given where i grew up uh, in the melting pot area uh so like you know we're going like power ballad stuff like i'm thinking like stuff like journey separate ways or like bon jovi you know always like if we're like doing like group yeah. singing i can't sing but if we're doing group singing i'm gonna sing along to those songs uh and you know i think of, like stuff from the 90s you know outcast for sure stands out to me like okay. I, what's crazy man I, I don't know if anyone has like as good of a one through five pure album run that outcast has I know I'm really, I really don't even think so. I think you can put like all the greats into that, like the conversation, like the Beatles, like anyone. And think of just like one through five albums in a row where like they just didn't miss. Like they just didn't miss. Like they're amazing, you know, wall to wall albums. Uh, a lot of them still stand up. They do a lot of things creatively. Wish they'd come back and do some more things together. But uh, I would say definitely uh, Outcast. I got definitely stands out to me. But I, I, an individual project that stands out to me the most is the first DMX album. Like because okay. Grant in my age, like the first DMX album was everywhere. Like you could not avoid it. Like it was just everywhere yeah. in my area. Yeah. And like that definitely stands out to me. It was such. It was. It was just, like the biggest thing ever right on what uh, what are you most grateful for at this time i mean just this man like getting to be able to do stuff like this like i said i'm someone that was working a full-time job before this you know I, I i quit my full-time job of 15 years to transition to do something to, to, that i love to, to a game uh and like i said i, I rephrased it earlier like i'm working in the toy aisle i definitely don't take that for granted. I'm appreciative yeah. of that. I hope I get to do this for as long as possible. I tell my wife all the time, like, I don't know if this will be the last year. We don't know, right? We don't know when, when the bubble pops. Uh, I'm just really grateful that I get to do this. And I've been fortunate, like I said, to meet so many people along the way that are part of my now just daily life that are in my inner circle of friends with my other friends that I grew up with and have known my entire life and then getting to do things like this and, and share that with you and other people. So definitely don't think that, uh, you know, just because I, I'm a subscription service now and I'm behind a paywall that, uh, I forget what the roots are and I, 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 I forgot the common folk. I love it. I love that. <laughs> now what, uh, what, uh, you know, can you name some of the people that have just had a huge impact on you during your, your journey here? Yeah, like I said, I mean, I would never be anywhere without Denny, obviously opening the door for me. Davis Maddock opening the door and just instilling in me confidence that they're coming to, to talk on football podcasts, right? And then Rummy putting me, you know, in contact with, uh, you know, guys like Sig and Evan, you know, Sal Stefani was part of that original XN sports group. Uh, you know, like I said, guys like, you know, Pat Thorman and then the continued, I would say, new cr crop of people that I see out here, right? Like I just started following, uh, you know, Ryan Heath and Jacob Gibbs. I'm seeing these, what these guys do. Dwayne, Dwayne McFarland for specifically like of recent people that he's got a yeah. couple of years under his belt now, but the kind of work he's doing, like I see those people generating the work they're doing, Hayden Winks. And it's what I, I want to be better. I want to be able to keep up with those guys. I want to still be able to, to compete with those guys. So I love that, you know, and, and still be friends with them too. When I say compete, like I've, I've asked Dwayne is adorable. What a great, great, great man he is. I've got to be yeah. fortunate to hang out with him a few times. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's so many people in the industry, but I, I, I'm happy that people are advancing the industry and keep pushing people like me to be better. 
Now, what advice do you have for people that want to get more involved in the space? I think just like any, I only, I think it's not even just for, well, it's two pronged, right? Like I would say before the non-specific fantasy side is as always like just pursue something you're passionate about, right? Like pretty, pretty telltale. F try to, we are in a period where like, it's more open than ever for you to do something you love and to try to do it. And I get it scary. Like I said, I quit my job. I had a family, you know, I didn't know, like I got to fall on my face. Who knows what I got that job back. Right. Like you, you got to take that leap of faith, uh, so to speak, and just do something you're passionate about. It, life will be so much more fulfilling if you're able to accomplish that. So definitely try to fulfill your life with something that fill, fill your life with something like that. Um, and then as in particular, as it regards to the fantasy space, like definitely find your niche, right? Like find what your strong suit as you no longer in fantasy have to be like a, someone that does cover it all. I talked about me like being probably someone that like stands out as being more like kind of balanced. I could do, I'm kind of even keel. I think that's what stands yeah. out to me yeah. for a lot of people is like, I can give you a dynasty take. I can give you a redraft take a rookie take. I can talk about game theory or those things, but like find something you're strong at that can build you an audience. Like I had the Konami code or the worksheet, find something that sets you apart that gets you an audience and then cultivate that audience around there. But uh, always create the kind of content for the audience you want to have. And you'll find that, that those people will find you uh, always. Fantastic advice. Now, Rich, is there anything that uh, we haven't covered that you want to share before we close things out? Oh, man. I mean, people probably just say, I'm tired of hearing them talk. Uh, <laughs> get out of there. Uh, so, I mean, if you've got anything else for me, let me know. I will say, if you're listening to this and you are coming to the expo, and you do see me, even if I'm with, like I said, a group of people and they said, people, I hate to interject, but like, feel free to bump into me, introduce yourself. Uh, I'll be glad to talk to you. As will most people at the expo wide open when it comes to just people wanting to connect with people. So definitely get out there and, and shake some hands for sure. Now, can you tell listeners where to find you? Yeah, I'm at uh, sharpfootballanalysis.com. All of my work, like I said, we're cranking out the draft kit there at this time. I'm adding to it, you know, every week, uh, four to five articles a week at this point, all the way through the start of the season. There is also free content there too. If you're just like, oh yeah, I don't want to subscribe, go peruse the free content. I guarantee you'll learn something from it and be able to take it, take uh, something to apply to your, you know, drafts if you don't want to be a subscriber as well. Uh, I'm still at Lord Reeves on Twitter, not Roto Reeves. Uh, so definitely, you know, engage with me on there. And like I said, the best way it, uh, is just keep replying to me, right? Like that's the best thing to do. That, that's, that ties into something I would say for the fantasy to the previous question as well. Yeah. Even if you think you're annoying someone, if you have good thoughts and someone like JJ or, you know, like if they keep saying like, oh, wow, you know, she's, she's in my mentions and uh, good, good ideas and always in here with like constructive, even if it's criticism, but constructive or pushing the, pushing the conversation forward uh, yeah. because, you know, uh, that was the case of how we all got better in 2012, 2013, right? Like we all made each other better. Uh, you don't see as much as that right now. Right. Yeah. And I, I would say definitely, even if you feel like you're being alone, just do that. Uh, there's so many people that I've like, that have become followers of mine because, they kept coming to my mentions and had good thoughts and, and, and things like that. So be annoying, be a little annoying. That's cool. There you go. Uh, great suggestions. Yeah. <laughs> engagement, you know, engage with people and, uh, and, and the rest will follow. Now, thank you so much for joining me, Rich Rebo. I appreciate you coming on and I can't wait to see you in Canton, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for listening to the fantasy football unlimited podcast until next time. Be sure to follow and subscribe to all of FFU's social media accounts for daily content.